What is up everyone? It is time for a classic IMNC PowerPC Mac unboxing and today is so exciting because we're unboxing a machine that I have never ever owned. I've never even seen one in person, I've never used one at all, I've only ever seen them in photos and it's crazy because it's such a glorious gem of a PowerPC Mac. I just can't believe I've never owned one until now or never even seen one. So in this box that I'm gonna pull up into the frame right here, in this box is a PowerBook G4. But it's not just any PowerBook G4. As you guys who have been watching for a little while probably know, I've had various 12 inch and 15 inch PowerBook G4 aluminum models. This guy is a PowerBook G4 titanium. This is my first ever time checking out a titanium power book and I cannot wait to dig in. But before we do, I've got to say a massive, massive thank you to Haley because Haley donated this machine completely free of charge to IMNC in order for me to make this video, unbox it, add it to my collection and just have it here to do whatever I want with. So Haley, thank you so, so much for your generosity. And she's also helped me out with a couple of extra bits and pieces for another machine that I've got a video coming up about soon. Another machine, I needed some parts. She hooked me up with parts and she's just extremely resourceful when it comes to a very generous collection of old Macs and Mac bits and pieces. So Haley, thank you so much. This is incredible. So I'm not going to mess around at all. We are going to get straight to it. I can't find my nice knife, so I'm going to use this pair of scissors. Okay, so... <laughs> I forgot about this. I forgot all about this. Check this out, guys. In the top of the box, we have got, man, it's been years since I've held one of these. It's been absolutely years. Haley happened to mention to me that she had several iPhone 3GSs and she sent a photograph to me and she's been kind enough to include one in the package. She's just sent one with the PowerBook. Look at that, iPhone 3GS. And for those of you who are wondering why I'm kind of hyped about this, this was my first ever iPhone. For those of you who were watching way back in 2010, you'll remember that I transitioned from recording videos with my mum's digital camera to recording videos with the iPhone 3GS. And here is a 3GS. Now mine was white, 16 gig. This is a black 16 gig model. You should be able to see just there. It looks in really nice condition actually. Just in comparison to the iPhone 12 mini. It's just crazy, isn't it? Absolutely bonkers. So yeah, I forgot all about that. Haley. thank you so, so much for sending me that 3GS. Let's take a look at what else we've got in here. We've got top-notch packaging. That's one thing I absolutely love about getting stuff from other uh, owners and users of this old stuff is it gets packaged really well. When you buy stuff randomly off eBay, you never know what you're gonna get, of course, in terms of packaging. So here's an item I'm gonna put to one side. Those of you with a keen eye may be able to tell what that is through the bubble wrap. It is a portion of a 13 inch white MacBook. To be specific, this is the display or the top case, the lid. Um, and we've also got a few keyboard keys in here as well because I've got a little bit of a MacBook video coming up. So that's something to look forward to in the future. But for now, let's focus entirely on the PowerBook. First ever time checking out a titanium PowerBook G4. Here we go. <laughs> wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. Look at this. It is crazy how different it feels. It is crazy. It is a wildly different machine. A completely different beast altogether. But equally as gorgeous. <laughs> Okay, cool, right, I'm gonna move some of this stuff out of the way and we'll open the lid together. So I will of course get you guys some close-up shots in a minute. First of all, I just wanna open it up and take a little look for the first time. So latch on the front, just like the later models and the first gen MacBook Pro. <laughs> oh man, the beauty and design of this thing does not 
translate well in photos and videos. This looks it, just like seeing any Mac design for the first time in person is really where it needs to be done. And then you can accurately look at pictures and stuff. But wow, this just does not look anything like I imagined in terms of the general vibe that the machine gives off. It is just such an industrial beast of a design. It's saying, yes, I am the most powerful notebook in the world at my time of release, of course. I am a beast, here I am. But at the same time, the difference, I don't have my PowerBook G3 here um, to compare it to, but the difference going from the G3 to the G4, this is just a million years more sleek, isn't it? Because just the whole thing, the whole thing just oozes transformation. You know, it's Apple when they took every single product line and just made everything look gorgeous, ditched everything that didn't look completely gorgeous. Um, one thing that screams out right away is the display. Let me get you guys a closer look. The display is just hugged by the case, completely hugged. And at the time, it still looks glorious today in terms of thin bezel design. That is really, really thin. It's thinner than the bezel on my Retina MacBook Pro. Um, I find it crazy about the modern Mac designs, how they've never kind of achieved better than this. This is like the best. And the power books, the, the aluminium power books as well, in terms of thin bezels, um, the display just fills the lid completely, no wasted space. It is, of course, the first widescreen power book and that is a big deal. I know that was pushed heavily in the advertising and rightly so because that is, of course, a huge point. Um, and then looking at the keyboard, just before we move on to the keyboard, the matte display as well, just seeing the lovely smooth matte display and this one in particular looking in very good clean condition as well. Uh, the keyboard, look at this. It's got that kind of see-through look about it. Similar to the kind of overall look of an iMac G3 keyboard. Um, but, oh man. Wow. So that keyboard feels gorgeous. It is really, really similar to the keyboard on the later PowerBooks and the first-gen MacBook Pros. Uh, again, for those of you who've been watching me for a while, I absolutely love those keyboards. The feel, the design, really nice keyboards to type on. This, this seems to be where that started. And it fe the, the keyboard feels quite a bit different because the key material is different, of course. The travel. The key kind of bottoms out with more aggression. That's kind of the best way I can describe the main difference. There's no kind of the, there's a nice cushioned feeling, but then there's no mush. Let me grab a first gen MacBook Pro. I just happen to have one here actually. So I've got a first generation MacBook Pro and this is gonna represent the later power books as well. Now this machine is a bit beaten up. Um, I do have a backlog of machines to make videos about actually. Uh, let's have a feel. Wow. Do you know what? The titanium feels a little more precise. And like I say, they bottom out more aggressively. Um, it's like there's an extra cushion under these keys. Also a little bit less effort required to type on this guy. I love them both. They feel amazing. It's, it's a real treat to actually type on one of these. It's a real treat. And look at that, look in terms of the aspect ratio here. This almost doesn't look widescreen these days, does it? But in comparison to a PowerBook G3, the display is extremely wide. But when you look at a more modern widescreen with definitely a more pronounced widescreen aspect ratio, this almost looks like a non-widescreen notebook. Still absolutely crazy. Let's get the MacBook Pro out of here. Again, I'll catch you guys up on all these random machines that I've got around my office here. So here next to the keyboard, we have the power button. And the power button is very similar design to the later PowerBooks. So it definitely stands out in this case. 
We've also got uh, two speaker grills and the keyboard looks to be removable on this guy. Yes, it is. The keyboard on this guy is indeed removable like the iBooks and the PowerBook G3s, something they took away in the aluminium PowerBooks. So glad I didn't break that then. I have broken one of these before. I broke my buddy's iBook G3 uh, keyboard clip. I've never kind of forgiven myself about that. Um, yeah, you get access to the RAM, which is really cool. There's two sticks in it right now. You can actually see quite a lot inside the machine. Have a little look under the keyboard there. Very nice. Let's put the keyboard back for now. I don't want to go too crazy to begin with. Coming down to have a little look at the trackpad. This is quite a generous sized trackpad for the age of the machine. Um, it's probably about the same size as an aluminium PowerBook G4's trackpad. It kind of looks a little bigger, um, but I think that's just an illusion because it's got this surround piece here that the aluminium doesn't have, this sort of indent in the top case. Single button trackpad. Uh, this, of course, predates any kind of multi-touch trackpad. It was about halfway through the aluminium PowerBook's lifetime um, or lifespan that the two-finger scrolling came in. So the earlier aluminiums uh, have got functionality-wise the same trackpad as this machine, whereas the later aluminium ones, you can do your two-finger scrolling, which is, uh, of course, pretty cool. Now, let's close her up for now. We've got the single, like the aluminium PowerBook G4s, we've got the single point for the latch in the middle of the machine. So when you close the machine, now on this one, on the titanium, it's nowhere near as bad. But what happens on the aluminium 15 inch models is for some reason they just tend to rock back and forth. It's not that great on that center point of the latch. Um, it's very precise here actually, that closes nicely. But what they did on the MacBook Pros, let's bring back this rather beaten up MacBook Pro into the frame. What they did with the MacBook Pro is they, whoops, it's just falling to pieces here in front of our eyes, but whoa, it really is. Okay, <laughs> they actually increased it to two points of contact for the latch, like a double latch system here. Same button on the front, but two points of contact. It closes a little better, um, but it doesn't seem to be a problem at all on the titanium. This latch operates wonderfully and a really stiff hinge on this as well, really stiff. So of course, another big deal is the Apple logo on the PowerBook line was finally flipped around uh, to face the right direction when you open the machine. So the PowerBook G3s have got the upside down Apple logo, similar to an iBook G3 clamshell. This guy, you open it up and here it is. So this PowerBook, along with the iBook G3 Snow. Um, they were the first Macs to start that. Hey, I've got a Mac. My Apple logo is lit up in front of me kind of vibe, um, which is, of course, a wonderful thing about the Mac. Just that light up glowy Apple logo. Worst thing they removed from the newer models, definitely. So looking on the front of the machine, a uh, design that I've always loved on these machines is the front load, slot load, optical drive. So just like the two machines that came after this guy, the aluminium G4 and the first gen MacBook Pro, slot load drive on the front here. This model, I'm not sure on the particular specs on, uh, specs on this guy specifically, we'll take a look at that in a minute, but you could get combo drive versions of these so you could play your DVDs. Another huge thing with the widescreen display in that, this was just a a multimedia beast at the time, so you could get your DVDs in here. Also get a CD burner and whatnot. Um, just absolute tremendous capabilities of the machine. Looking on the bottom, we have got the battery, removable battery, with a battery indicator LED. It says it's got full battery, so that's really cool. Let's pop the battery out. Not sure if this is an original battery or not. Aha, look, it's stamped with an Apple logo, so it looks original. It's a slightly different shade to the bottom of the machine, but yeah, there we have it. Looks original and it's showing us full, which is great. So there's the battery compartment for the removable battery. Let's pop that back in. Very similar to the later PowerBooks. We've also got some kind of access door under here. Now the RAM, of course, is under the keyboard. I'm not entirely sure what is in here or what this is for. I'll have to have a look online and then uh, update you guys later on in the video if I remember. Uh, looking on the sides of the machine, let's go to this side first. 
We have got what I believe is a Wi-Fi antenna, and we've got one the other side as well. And I remember back to the keynote where Steve Jobs introduced the aluminium power books, uh, the 12 inch and the 17 inch first of all, because the 15 inch continued in the titanium form uh, for a little while until they released a 15 inch aluminium version. I remember he pointed out specifically that they'd moved the antennas from the base of the machine to the display. Um, so I hope I'm not making a fool of myself, and I hope these are indeed actually the Wi-Fi antennas. I believe they are, I'm pretty certain of that. Um, and then they got moved to the display, the lid of the machine, so that when you open the laptop, the antennas are higher than sitting on the desk. So presumably a little bit better signal like that. Over here, we have uh, what looks to be a fan vent and a Kensington security lock. And you can notice screws on the side of the lid here, screws on the side of the case uh, for the lid. That's definitely something. And uh, an interesting hinge design. You can see that this is certainly a different hinge approach to what they were using a little later on. Uh, they managed to streamline the hinge a little better in the later models. Um, this hinge pokes out but it doesn't look half bad, doesn't look half bad at all. Um, it just all fits in with the design because that continues the, I don't know if this portion is plastic in here, is it? It certainly appears that way, but is it just, I'm really not sure. Is it just a different shade of titanium? I have no idea. This portion here around the machine, very, very nice. And the hinge just sort of echoes that material looks great. The Apple logo on this guy looks really nice. The Apple logo is extremely shallow. There's not a lot of gap between the logo and the lid. So that's just got a really appealing look about it. Looks stunning. So over on this side of the machine, we have the conveniently placed headphone jack and it'll become clear why that is quite convenient in just a second. Another fan vent, our PC card slot and the other Wi-Fi antenna. But the rest of the ports, just like the power books before it, are located at the back. So it was when the aluminium came out that they ditched this all together. So, boom. That is lovely, isn't it? Let's do that again. There it is. And what's it like when it's on the desk? It just sits down there. Loads of room for your connectors. Now, what's nice as well is the connector icons to say what they are, the little badges and not only next to the actual port, but also on the lid. So when you've flapped this down and you look at it facing downward as if you were leaning over when this was on the table or whatever, you'd be able to see where all the ports are. So that's really cool. So let's run down the ports. First of all, on the outside, I forgot to mention, we have our power socket. So our charger goes in there and inside, We've got a lovely array of connectivity. So Firewire 400, I believe the PowerBook G3 had two Firewire 400 ports uh, from memory anyway, but this one's got a single Firewire 400 port. We have an ethernet port, originally 10100, but I believe the second revision of the titanium added the gigabit ethernet. Here we've got two USB uh, 1.1 speed ports, probably a vent of some sort, again, on the door as well, really nice. DVI, that is huge. So digital video out of the PowerBook. S-Video, analog video, still out. This is something they retained as a combination through the whole PowerBook G4 line, S-Video and DVI, very nice. Audio in and our 56K dial-up modem. A wonderful array of ports for the early noughties. Very, very capable machine. So I think we've rambled enough about the machine. Let's power it up. It's probably not a wise move to press the power button without plugging this guy in. Even though that battery is showing full, it's an old battery. So let's plug this guy in. So I've got my power adapter from my little 12 inch power book. Uh, not sure if this is going to be 100% correct, but it should get us up and running for now. I'll probably keep my eyes peeled for a dedicated charger for this guy. My little 12 inch PowerBook G4 charger is lighting up nicely while connected to this guy. So that's good. Three, two, one, go. There we go. We had a nice little bong. Now 
What's really cool is I know for a fact that Haley has put a fresh install on this machine of Mac OS X and she asked, do I want Tiger or Leopard? And I actually chose Leopard because something that I've kept quiet until this point in the video. This is actually an 867 megahertz machine. So I requested Leopard because even though it'll probably be a bit of a dog on this machine, I've never run Leopard on the minimum system requirements. An 867 megahertz G4 processor is the absolute bare minimum that you can get away with when running Leopard. Anything slower um, and it won't install without Leopard Assist or something like that. So I went for Leopard because ultimately I want to have Tiger on this machine, but I want to check out Leopard first. I want to see how it runs. And then when I'm done with my Leopard experience on the Titanium PowerBook, we will install Tiger. And that can be a separate video in the future maybe. Um, but what is gonna happen here? Let's see. Brand new fresh install. Oh, it's gonna do it, isn't it? It's gonna do it. Oh, wow! There we go, so meter keys are here on this guy. Um, yeah, so apologies that I had to cut that. Probably gotta cut that in editing anyway, which is a shame. It's been a while since I've seen the Leopard intro or any Mac OS X intro in person. I feel like we haven't done this sort of thing in a long time. Continue, British. I also love it when somebody sets me up a machine from fresh and does it properly so that it arrives with the first time installer and the intro video and stuff like that. We're gonna skip this information and we're just gonna create my account. Okay, that's more like it. Here we go, let's move that a bit closer. Lovely. Okay, so there's the Leopard desktop and I can hear the fans running, so the fans are working and I've experienced a tiny bit of beach ball already. Of course, Leopard on this is a tall order. 867 megahertz G4, but let's just see generally how snappy it is. Let me just enable some zooming so I can see. There we go, 867 megahertz. And for RAM, we've got 768 megabytes of SD RAM. I'll have to take a look and see what the maximum you can put in this guy is, possibly 768 megs. Um, but there we go, running Leopard version 10.5.1. So when we connect to a network, there will be updates to Leopard on this machine. Um, Let's have a little look at the other things here. So this is a PowerBook G4 15 inch PowerBook 3.5. I'm gonna pull this up on Mac Tracker on my system behind me here. Okay, so introduced in November of 2002, discontinued in September of 2003. So this is the last titanium PowerBook. This is the PowerBook G4 one gigahertz slash 867 megahertz. So a really nice machine. This guy was $2,299 when it came out and $2,999 for the one gigahertz model. 133 meg system bus, 40 or 60 gig, 4200 RPM hard drive. Slot load combo drive or super drive. Wow, let's take a look at what we've got in here. So ATA, Fujitsu, 37.26 gigabytes. So we've got the 40 gig disc and the Machita CDRW, very nice. So this will probably this will be the combo drive. It'll read the DVDs and it'll write the CDs, as far as I know. Let's have a little look. Bluetooth, no information found. No, this is pre-Bluetooth. Yes, first PowerBook G4 with Bluetooth is the first little 12 inch. Disc burning, of course, we do have the CDRW. Firewire, Firewire 400. So chipset model ATYRV250M9. That should be a mobility Radeon 9000 with 32 megs of VRAM. This came in a 64 meg version as well. I presume uh, if you had the one gigahertz model, that would be the 64 meg version. 1280 by 854 resolution on the display. Quartz Extreme supported with this card, which is very nice. Software core image. Looking at memory, we've got Sodium Zero. That is 512 megs. And then uh, 256 megs bumping it up. Let's have a look at what our max RAM is. It does say that the maximum RAM is one gig. So you should be able to put two 512 meg sticks in here, which is really nice. 
Uh, PC cards, no information found, of course. Power, USB, we've got two built-in USBs, 12 megabits per second. That is about everything of interest there in the system profiler. We have a completely 100% stock Leopard install. So here's our little 40 gig drive. Used 11.7 gigabytes, available 25.43 gigs. Nice. Let's just launch an application here, anything. I just wanna give the keyboard a little test. Quite responsive in Leopard here with this. It's, uh, it's feeling really nice. Everything is working wonderfully on this machine. Keyboard feels so nice. <laughs> okay, cool. That's enough of that. General system performance feels really, really nice. I wanna have a quick look at the trackpad settings. Trackpad. Yes, so we have the clicking and dragging for gestures. So we can, we can do tapping. So tapping is working. Um, but we've got no two finger support like I discussed earlier. This is sort of um, a year or so away from that, a couple of aluminium versions away from that, I do believe. I think it'd be quite cool if we test the DVD drive because even though we don't think much about that today, that is of course a big deal for these old machines. Let's see what it does. Ooh, very nice. Takes it perfectly. The DVD player seems to work like a champ. Yeah, this one, the DVD drive works really well and Leopard loaded it right up. I still stand by this and I can't believe I'm still saying this after all these years, but I still stand by the fact that these early PowerBook displays or these rather just generally PowerBook displays, this one included, looks better in terms of quality and overall niceness than a modern cheap like HP laptop or Acer laptop or whatever, plastic piece of rubbish. Um, this display looks really nice. And it's crazy because this machine is, you know, what, 20 years old. So it's just bonkers to think that really. Um, but the display still holds up perfectly in the viewing angles. The viewing angles are nice, you know, it's just lovely. Of course, no LED. This is way before LED backlight. So you get a huge difference there, but this comes out absolutely perfectly. What I think we should do is connect this to my network and we should grab a little game off my server that is gonna work on this PowerBook. Just a little something, I'll see what I've got. Let's see what this PowerBook makes of my network. Boom. So I've plugged it into my network. Let's see what it does. I think we can turn the Wi-Fi off. Turn Wi-Fi off. It's not gonna help us out much. Let's have a look and see if we are connected to my network. Connected, and we've got an IP. Awesome, okay, cool. So let's go and have a little look, a little nosy on my network. <laughs> I love this, 20 year old machine and there are all my servers. There's absolutely everything. So let's have a little browse of Scaro because we want to check out some games. Boom, we're in, okay. So it's been a few days since the last clip I recorded and I've just been playing around with this PowerBook, really getting to grips with it. And I've had quite a shock. It is a really nice machine. So first of all, when I posted a little teaser photo of this on Instagram, a couple of people mentioned Leopard and how it would probably run like a complete and utter dog on this system. Uh, that's really not the case. This is minimum system requirements for Leopard. It's got a little bit more RAM, 512 you can get away with Leopard. Um, this has got uh, 768 megs but the 867 megahertz clock speed is the minimum requirement for the G4 processor to run Leopard. And it runs like a dream, it really does. It feels like any other single CPU G4 system. It just feels completely fine. No quicker, no slower than any other PowerBook really. I guess unless you've got them side by side, I've not compared this side by side with any of my other machines by the way. So just going completely from feel at the moment, um, it feels just fine. Everything is really snappy and responsive around the OS. You click on something, it pops up right away and everything just works as you'd expect it to. Um, not the fastest thing on the planet, but works 
tremendously for what it is. So Leopard out of the way, that's great. I will be popping Tiger on this machine sooner rather than later, um, just because I really don't need Leopard on here. This will be a lovely little power book to run Tiger. I've got quicker power books to, to run Leopard. So um, I just wanted Leopard on here for the curiosity factor. Um, and yeah, I'm really impressed. So I'm going to demonstrate a couple of things to you guys, mainly games, because I've been playing around with a few older Mac games. I installed a load of games directly from my server over the network and everything worked completely fine. As I showed very quickly in the last clip, connecting to my server was absolutely no problem. And um, the network speed has actually been incredible, connecting this to a gigabit network, copying files over, just copying like 1.5, 1.6 gigabyte uh, disk images for games has been really, really nice and smooth. Um, so anyway, let's just launch a game. First one I'm going to launch is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, uh, only because I don't have a no CD patch for this game, so I've got to have the disc image actually mounted for the game to run. It's uh, it's the only one like that. I try to get no CD patches if I can for games. It just makes life so much easier and so much quicker when uh, running these for testing and whatnot. Um, but having the disc image mounted, there's no physical CD in the drive. Having the disc image mounted it's not a big problem. Now, the other thing about my copy of Tony Hawk 3 is, uh, as you can probably tell already, it's not English. This is, I believe, Spanish. Um, so, yeah, luckily I know this game pretty well. It doesn't make much of a difference, but um, let's check out. I've just unlocked Rio. So Rio isn't a challenge-based um, level. It's uh, get the highest score. So let's do, a, let's do a run here and see how far we get while I'm talking. Now, I'm actually using a generic uh, USB controller. Let me just pause this really quickly and show you guys. This is like a PS1, PS2 controller clone USB. I've had this for years and years. I've got two of them, I've probably owned them the best part of 15 years or so. I bought them when I was a kid. Um, and they work okay with the Mac, they work fine. There is a little extension that I need to use to get them up and running properly on the Mac. I'll show you that in a minute. It's just a little utility that sits in system preferences. Um, really handy little utility, actually. Uh, the only annoying thing about using this controller for Tony Hawk, you absolutely need a gamepad for Tony Hawk, definitely, because the keyboard mappings are uh, terrible. And also, playing it with the keyboard is near impossible anyway, in my opinion. Um, although I did have good fun playing it with the keyboard, you need to rely on the number pad. So I had to have an external keyboard connected. The whole thing was just absolutely hilarious. Um, but as I was saying, with this controller and the compatibility with the Mac, I only get four action buttons. So I can get the four, I can get the Ollie and the three trick command buttons, but I can't get the revert button, which is annoying for Tony Hawk 3 because it means that you can't continue any of your combos once you come off a ramp. So all the high scores and that have to come from um, grinds and, and other things. So a bit annoying, but this is only for testing anyway. And as you guys can see, this is running beautifully. Now, one quick thing, this isn't running at native resolution. Um, we weren't, you know, running these games at native resolution back in the day, you know. Um, I don't really, when I test these old Macs and test them with games, I don't really strive to run at full res on anything because nothing really does it um, for any of these games. So we're running in a much lower resolution. We are running in widescreen. Um, I don't even know what the resolution is, but it looks, looks absolutely fine. And as you can see, the frame rate is buttery smooth. I could probably crank it up a little bit if I wanted to, um, but there's no real need. It looks really, really nice. Everything is on default. Yeah, like there, coming down that ramp. Can't continue that combo. There's no way to do it but I can continue grind combos with manuals. And I'm sure we'd all love to hear the soundtrack pumping uh, turned up, but unfortunately, obviously I can't get, oh no, what a shame. I can't get any of uh, this music on camera. So big shame, but never mind. Final run, come on, let's do something decent and then we'll move over to the next game. You can see a little stutter there. That happens from time to time, but perfectly normal, perfectly acceptable for this age machine. Everything looks and runs fantastically. This game back in the day did run on some very low end systems. Uh, Tony Hawk 3 was the final N64 game in the US. And it's a little bit different because that ran on the older game engine, I do believe. So this is the newer game engine when the look of Tony Hawk, the look and feel just completely transformed from the older Tony Hawk 1 and 2 days. Um, so this version looks consistent with the PS2 version 
and the Xbox version, GameCube, PC, you know, looks just as good on the Mac as any of those systems really. With this little 32 megabyte video card here in this PowerBook, not bad at all. So I think I've had my fill of retro Tony Hawk. Um, let's check out something else. This is the only game we're gonna be using the controller for. So I just wanted to show you guys that. Let's quit out of this. While I'm here and while I remember, I'll just show you the utility that I'm talking about. And you can still download this and it's got a PowerPC version readily available online, USB overdrive. So essentially what this allows you to do, this is shareware, so you've got to wait out the little pop-up here, but it will allow you to completely use it. Just got to wait for the countdown. Cool, register later. What this allows you to do is select any of your um, devices. So you can see your devices here, generic USB joystick. That's what mine is showing up as. And then you can see the buttons. So button one, two, three, and four. If your buttons aren't displayed, you are meant to be able to record buttons in the list. So you're meant to be able to tap a button and it appears and then you can map it freely to whatever you want. Um, but that doesn't work with my controller, unfortunately. But you can see our movement, WASD is configured here. And then our tricks to the uh, numpad. And that's how I was playing Tony Hawk. And you can do it application specific, enable, disable. It's a really cool little utility actually. And you can do all sorts of fun things for um, modifier keys and mouse cursor stuff and whatnot. And you can, you can pretty much select anything. You can get it to do anything launch application, anything, fantastic. Really versatile USB application, not just for um, not just for game controllers, but for fiddling with your USB input overall from any device. Okay, so that aside, um, I've got a couple more games installed on here. I always check out Quake 3 on videos, so I'm not gonna check out Quake 3 today. I've covered it loads on the channel. This G4 version of Quake 3 runs really, really nicely on this machine. I want to show you something that pushes this a little bit more. Um, so we're going to eject that one. I'll show you guys the original Call of Duty. I've got through the training and what I'll show you is the first map. Now this one is running slightly not in full widescreen. So we're at a fairly low uh, resolution and quite straightforward normal, normal settings. Nothing too crazy going on at all. I'm going to turn the brightness up ever so slightly on this game. Just go back out of that. And yeah, I've loaded, I've saved up to the first level. So we've gone through the training, so I can just give you guys a little demonstration of the game. I'm just gonna walk around the hill a little bit and you should be able to see the performance. Again, quite low resolution, but it just doesn't matter as much as it does these days, you know? It really doesn't with these older games on these older machines, lower res screens. Um, it just really doesn't make that much of a difference. I mean, of course, if you could run it at full native resolution, it would look look really nice, but this looks just just fine, just dandy the way it is. So I can have the sound up for this one, which is really good. As you can see, walking around looks really good. So, as you can hopefully see, really smooth, really nice. Uh, all those bombs and gunfire, everything, just really, really nice. No complaints at all. Um, I know for a fact that this machine would not run Call of Duty 2 because there was a significant increase um, you know, needed for the capabilities of the system. I remember trying to play Call of Duty 2 on my 1.5 gigahertz PowerBook G4 back in school <laughs> and uh, yeah it was playable it was just about playable but it was very very taxing on that system and that was a 1.5 um, 64 megs of VRAM so you know essentially double the capabilities in a way um, but obviously not quite Go, go, go. 
So I've jumped into Splinter Cell, and this one just so happens to be a game that I have that is the exact match minimum system requirements to the minimum um, to the uh, specs of this system. So an 867 megahertz G4 is the minimum system requirement to get Splinter Cell to run. And uh, I haven't given it a go yet, so we'll try it live on camera just to see how it runs. I am aware that this video is getting a little bit long, so we'll just have a quick bash of this one. So far so good on the uh, cutscenes. So, of course, we're only in the uh, training here. It's no guarantee as to how the rest of the game is going to run, but everything is completely fine and absolutely lovely, to be perfectly honest. As you can see, mass movement and everything is super smooth. So, super quick little bash of Splinter Cell, and then we've got Raven Shield on here as well, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Three, and again, shouldn't be any issues with this game. Nice and OCD patch on this one up and running as well, just like the others. So here we are. And as you can see, yeah, you know, absolutely no problems whatsoever. Not the prettiest thing in the world, but uh, running, playable, just as you'd expect. So as a little new millennium era gaming Mac, it's really nice, really capable. It's similar in capability to my G3 Blue and White, uh, maybe a little bit more capable, a little bit less fuss to get things up and running properly. And this was this was really out of the box actually, just get the games installed and I was well away. I didn't really have to configure anything. Um, really nice on all of these games and this will play your Roller Coaster Tycoons, you know, all the way up to Roller Coaster Tycoon 3. Um, the Tony Hawk games like I've shown, probably pushing things a little bit too much to try and get a game like Doom 3 to run. Um, you'll need a little bit more of a capable G4 or a G5 to play Doom 3 with a fair bit beefier video card. But these slightly older, less demanding games run beautifully. Um, I will be trying some more in the future. And another thing that I think I'm going to try is because it takes so long to get these installed and all up and running with their patches and whatnot, I think it may be worth taking an image of this Leopard install once I've gone through this and actually got save data in all of these and played through to a particular level, make an image of the OS so that when I want to test games on another Power PC machine, I can just restore that image. That might be a much quicker way to do it um, for Leopard. I could do that the same for Tiger as well, because there are certain games I can't install because they won't run on Leopard. Um, but absolutely fantastic, really good gaming performance. I think we should round this off. We've got no kind of basis for comparison, but I think we should round this off with a couple of benchmarks and whatnot, because I think that'll be good fun. So we're gonna load them up from uh, my server. But one thing I wanted to show you guys really quickly was a little bit of screen sharing from the M1 Mac Mini. So it's a bit of a big deal, obviously, that we've got the M1 Mac Mini now. And chatting, it's very, very amusing chatting to the M1 Mac Mini from a PowerPC Mac. I'm just gonna quickly enter my login details here for screen sharing. And uh, as you can see, it's popped up on the screen. We've got my screensaver running. Both displays are running screen sharing on the PowerBook, which is really cool. And I'm just gonna select one of my displays. View display number one. And we will log into my system, which of course is just sat there right behind us. Let's log in. And uh, there you can see my Final Cut Pro 10 window is running on the PowerBook. Obviously not crazy smooth, but it's there. Let's just do an about this Mac. You can see my Mac Mini M1 2020, very amusing. So screen sharing works just fine between Leopard on the PowerBook and the M1 stuff. Very, very amusing there. I thought that was good fun. And um, let's just go and grab Geekbench quickly. Just gonna copy Geekbench from Scaro, uh, 23 megs going over nice and speedy. 
as you can see, no problems at all. This is the final PowerPC version of Geekbench, run for PowerPC 32-bit, and we'll compare with the, um, the results that are on Mac Tracker, I think. While this is running Geekbench, I did have a little bit of trouble trying to burn a CD with this Mac. Not 100% sure why that was. Could be my, uh, my blank CDs, um, just not playing ball with this particular drive. I only have one type of blank CD at the moment. I've got loads of different brands of blank DVDs, but only one spindle of blank CDs at the moment. They just won't read on this guy, but it doesn't have an issue with playing back a DVD at all. Um, I haven't tried playing back an audio CD. I'll have to give that a go, but I wasn't able to burn a CD. I was trying to get Unreal Tournament up and running, um, Unreal Tournament 2003, and I needed to install it from the CD. It just doesn't want to install any other way and I wasn't able to burn it on this machine. And hilariously, I wasn't able to burn it on my Mac Mini either because I needed Toast Titanium because it was a Toast file. And Toast 10 and Toast 11, which are the two versions that I have, don't work on newer machines. I mean, they're ancient versions by now. And I don't have any other retro Macs here hooked up in order to burn that CD. I've got a Mac Pro um, running Lion that's got my copy of Toast 10 installed and it works flawlessly so I can burn the disc on there but I couldn't get it to burn on the PowerBook even though I got Toast to successfully install and everything was great it still wouldn't burn. If I do have problems in the future I'll do some more proper testing with this optical drive it may be a fun fun project to put a replacement optical drive in here that can burn CDs uh, we'll have a look in the future and see if I need to do that I'm very doubtful the, the optical drive probably works fine it's probably just one of those things um, other than that, outside of that particular discussion, if you are looking to do this sort of thing with your Retro Mac, getting a copy of Toast Titanium is really helpful for mounting images um, to run these games and stuff. It really is a useful tool to have to be able to get some of these things up and running with the games specifically. So running this benchmark, there's not a lot of substance to it. It's not really much of a useful thing to do unless you're comparing two machines side by side but you can compare with the average Geekbench score of other machines of this spec from other user submitted results. Um, I really like it when we take a Mac and then we do a load of upgrades and then we run it again and we get a better score but we're just running this for the hell of it here in the video. So we've got a lovely little result of 538 on Geekbench and on the Geekbench website this model is listed as 524. So right within the ballpark of what the 15 inch uh, one gigahertz slash 867 megahertz model is capable of. Um, for reference, the PowerBooks kind of went all the way up um, to about double that. The dual layer SuperDrive PowerBook G4, some of them score really high, uh, over a thousand, but your typical aluminium PowerBook, you know, somewhere around the ballpark of 900. Uh, somewhere around there. Depending on clock speed, of course, clock speed varied greatly uh, going forward from this point all the way from 1 gigahertz up to 1.67 gigahertz, which is quite a jump really, um, but still very capable machines. And even though we're not measuring another machine right now, we can take this score for what it is. And I've noticed, um, I was looking on the Mac Tracker app, they used to include all the Geekbench results with older Macs as well on the Mac Tracker app, and I can't seem to find them. So they have gone, that's why I've browsed to the Geekbench website specifically to look at that. Bit of a shame if that's the case, but it may have something to do with the different versions of Geekbench. And now that we're much, much further along in terms of machines and models, and the scores are a little bit different in the way that they're calculated, it may just not make that much sense to include the older machine spec scores. Um, who knows? I really, really don't know, but it is what it is, and I thought that would be a fun little thing to do on the PowerBook here. I wanted to show you guys another thing that I discovered about the Titanium PowerBook after recording the first portion of the video, and that is the positioning of the sleep-wake light, and I really like it. When this system goes to sleep, when we close the lid, the light is located just here on the hinge. You can see it on the back hinge there. Looks really nice and it is breathing. It is a breathing LED, but the smoothness from the newer machines isn't quite there with that yet. But I thought that was just a really nice place for it. Uh, it got moved to the front and then it pretty much stayed on the front. Um, but that's just a nice touch that I forgot to mention. Another touch that I'd like to mention as well is when you've got stuff connected to this back door, it's a really cool design because it keeps all of the cable mess completely out of the way. 
because obviously that's really clean with all of that uh, behind the lid. The only slight thing is, it is quite difficult to pull out a network cable because of the tab. I've used a couple of different types of network cable in here now, and the tab for the RJ45 connector is blocked, so it's quite hard to get to. You've got to lift the machine. Let's just actually see live on camera how long it takes me to disconnect this. There we go, so not too bad, but you need a bit of thumbnail to get in there um, to be able to unplug it because the tab is right at the top. Tiny thing, it's not a problem with other connectors at all. Um, just thought I'd show that to you guys. So let's wake the power book back up. And waking from sleep and going to sleep is a really quick process. What I quickly wanna do right now live on camera is yank the power cord just to see if the battery holds at all, see exactly what the battery is doing. Uh, oh, it's telling me I disconnected from the server, of course, because I yanked that cable. That's not a problem. I'm going to pull out the power adapter and let's see what it tells us in the battery section up here. I'm pretty stunned to see that 6 hours 22 minutes is what it's telling me. Or is that 6 minutes 22 seconds? <laughs> no, but seriously, 6 hours... 13. I can't really do anything. Um, let's get a video up and running. If we play a video over the network, see how quickly the battery depletes. That'll be quite a good test, I think. Because with lots of these old machines, the batteries are just completely gone. There's just no life in them whatsoever, but this one seems completely fine. So let's pull up an actual film on here. I wonder what it'll make of this file. I've got a copy here of 2012. This is a 720p MP4. Let's run it over the network. Yeah, pretty choppy. Pretty, pretty choppy. You'd probably chop a little less if I copied it over locally, but I'm not gonna do that. I was just curious to see what it would make of it. I'm gonna copy a standard definition version of A Bug's Life, which is just over 800 megs over onto the desktop of the PowerBook here. Um, seems quite fitting because of the whole Pixar, Steve Jobs and this era thing. Although this machine is a little newer than A Bug's Life, um, still very, very appropriate, I think. I did actually read an article the other day as well that this grass wallpaper, along with uh, multiple other desktop wallpapers in Leopard, were actually photographs taken by Steve Jobs himself. Um, I think I saw that article posted on one of the Facebook groups. And I'm really not sure how legit that is. Apparently an ex- uh, Mac OS designer, I think, or someone that worked with Mac OS in some way, uh, worked towards the creation of it then, sorry, uh, development, um, said that, yeah, Steve Jobs took some of these photographs. So I, th I found that really quite fascinating. I really like this grass wallpaper anyway. I've always um, had it, you know, on and off over the years on my Leopard machines. It's just a lovely wallpaper. Let's play a bug's life here. Yeah, standard def runs quite a bit better. Hmm, having said that, that was choppy as anything. This isn't even a widescreen copy either. Yeah, just opening that file and messing around for a little while has led to three hours, one minute remaining. Uh, we're going to ignore that. It even quit. I'm going to go on better performance because QuickTime doesn't want to play ball with this video at all. Two hours, 57 remaining. Let's open this video and see how it runs now. Yeah, it's, it's barely running this video. It's crazy. Um, could just be the codec. Not 100% sure what this is. Um, it's nothing too heavy though. Should just run it. Yeah, some, something's going on with this video file. It doesn't really want to run it. Ah, okay. That's no problem. Something's, something was going on with that copy of A Bug's Life. There must be something about it that's uh, causing a bit of slowdown, a bit of struggle on the power book here. This episode of Doctor Who that I can't really show. That's why I'm doing this far away camera angle, by the way, guys, is so that um, none of this stuff causes any issues. This episode of Doctor Who from the 2005 series, series one of the new era, uh, Christopher Eccleston, is doing really nicely, playing smooth. Just a nice standard definition file. 
yeah, smooth as butter. Uh, but the reason we're doing this is to look at the battery life. So we're on better performance now and still showing up as two hours, 42 minutes remaining. Let's see if I can pull up any more info about the battery. This machine only has 147 battery cycles, condition good. Uh, battery installed, yes, obviously. Charge remaining, milliamp hours, 5,172. Full charge capacity, 5,497. You know, to me, that looks pretty damn good. We're running on the battery right now. I've been unplugged for 10 minutes or so, I guess. We're connected to the network, two hours 36. Absolute beauty. This battery seems incredible. So I've brought up my YouTube channel page in 10.4 Fox and uh, yeah, we got there in the end and still with the episode playing in the background. Quite a few minutes has passed while I was getting this up and running, crazy beach ball here. It's a lot to ask for this kind of machine, but 89% and looking at two hours, 18 minutes remaining. So the battery, the battery in this is half decent, like seriously, seriously half decent. Very, very nice. I wanted to just go back to a point that I made at the beginning of the video and give it a little bit more substance. So I managed to dig out my PowerBook G3. Now granted, this isn't the last revision, the last design change of the PowerBook G3. It's an earlier model, but it does represent the overall look of the PowerBook G3 and where we went from G3 to G4 and the changes. Um, so there were design changes after this, but this is just sort of a representation of the PowerBook G3 as a whole. So we've got the G3 and the G4, and the point I was making earlier about how much of a giant leap it was in terms of design um, and innovation, and just the way that the, this is truly brings us into a new millennium of the way that laptops look. This still looks like a portable that you could carry around today. Whereas this looks like a vintage computer. That's the difference. So let's have a little look in this. It's a PowerBook G3. I mean, I love the look of a PowerBook G3, um, but that's because I'm an Apple nerd, I guess. To lots of people today, this would look old and clunky, uh, thick, big, bulky. Uh, it's very, very heavy. Um, and then you've got the PowerBook G4 and pfft, you know, <laughs> there it is. I think if I had to choose one design change that really stands out as being probably the most prominent improvement, um, other than the overall design, obviously weight and just how sleek this new machine is. Um, if I had to choose one thing, it would definitely be the thickness aspect and not just of the overall machine, but I'm talking pretty much about the display. So if we bring in the G4, this is what we looked at earlier, just how thin the display is. I mean, even by today's standards, that is still just gloriously thin. Um, and then we bring in the G3. And look at that, night and day, night and day. When this was released, granted this wasn't the newest model, but when this was released, this was still considered a nice beastly powerhouse of a machine. So to go from that to that, and you know, we're not going from a pro product to a uh, consumer product with all the drawbacks and the limitations. This is apples to apples. This is a pro machine. This is a pro machine. Granted, this lost a couple of the expansion options, the expansion bays and stuff that the G3 PowerBook had, but you know, that's a separate discussion really. Um, this is just something else. And the fact that the design team back then, the engineering team went into um, the process of making this display so thin with the thin bezels, uh, they didn't have to do that. If you think about it, they really didn't. This machine would have looked just as glorious if it had a slightly thicker display or slightly thicker bezels. It may not look as gorgeous as it does today or these years later, because this is definitely the one feature that has carried this design forward and, and allows it to just slot in amongst modern machines. Obviously the widescreen aspect ratio really does stand out as well. As soon as a machine becomes widescreen, it looks instantly much, much more modern. Um, this must have looked so futuristic at the time when it came out. I'm quite glad I was actually able to find my PowerBook G3. Um, so I was able to do this demonstration, but yeah, just maybe I'll make a, a more in-depth video one day, but the, uh, the comparison there, the basic comparison is just off the charts and a huge thing as well. They flipped the Apple logo, like we were saying. So 
that was quite a cool thing. That was definitely cool. And the light up Apple logo, of course. Loads, loads of cool things started here. So it's definitely time to wrap up now. I've been rambling on about this machine for the last hour or so. Um, but before we do, there's nothing worse than leaving questions unanswered. So the issues I was having with the optical drive slash my CDs, I'm gonna try a music CD and see how far we get with that because I'm pretty sure it's just my discs. If we do have trouble with this optical drive, like I say, we'll source a replacement and maybe one day we can make a video about changing the optical drive. Um, but let's just try a CD and see how far we get. And again, to emphasize what happened before, it wasn't reading the disc at all. Um, it, there wasn't a problem with burning it. It just wouldn't read the blank disc. Uh, oh, and here we go. The CDs popped up on the desktop. And oh, it's asking us to import it into iTunes. Let's just actually try and play one of the tracks with QuickTime really quickly. Yep, yeah, works just fine. Works absolutely fine. So let's eject that. I'm gonna try the blank disc one more time. Got a fresh blank disc with the same variety. Same variety as I tried last time. Uh, it's the only ones I have, like I mentioned. Yeah, it's struggling to read the CD. It's making weird noises. And I've just double checked in the system profiler. It can definitely write CDs. CD minus R, CD write capabilities, CD write minus R minus RW. So should be fine. Um, I'll try a different variety of CDs, but like I say, if there is something going on, then we'll figure it out. It just spits out the disc. And this disc shows up okay on my other system. So that's one to check out going forward, but we know that it reads CDs, or at least it reads a music CD, which is fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to find that out at the end there. So to close out, I just wanna say that I am so grateful uh, for this machine. Haley, thank you so much for donating this to the channel. Um, it's gonna sit on my shelf, pride of place, and be there amongst my other laptops. Um, again, keep your eyes peeled for an upcoming video where I discuss my general laptop storage solution and a few other organization things around IMNCHQ. Um, I'm gonna make it a lot easier to access these machines, to be able to grab them in the future for comparisons and to make further videos. Um, so you should see more machines over the next couple of years resurface from previous videos because the majority of um, laptops anyway that I've unboxed in the past, I still own them. Um, and I have, an, I have quite a nice collection going on now of these old machines. So that's been the Titanium PowerBook G4. It's a beast. And it is just fascinating for me to see the jump, the evolution, the revolution. It was a huge leap forward. And it is such a nice milestone machine to own and to look back on. And leaving history aside for just a second, the capability of the machine today is still really strong. Looking for uh, a PowerPC laptop, a portable PowerPC Mac to do some of this stuff, you know, Tiger would be the sweet spot for this guy. Like I say, we'll install Tiger uh, in the future. But these kind of games, um, games from 1999 to 2003, 2004, the majority of those games run really sweet as a nut on this thing. And I've experienced some really nice performance from the majority of these games and I still have more to try. Um, other than that, it'll do basically anything that an early noughties power PC Mac will do. Um, nice 867 megahertz single CPU machine. Um, it's, you know, it's a middle of the road G4. It's a G4 that we all know and love, but in a glorious portable. So there we have it. I hope you guys have enjoyed as much as I have. It's been great fun. It's been a long time since we've had a full on ramble about a PowerPC Mac. Leave your comments down below. Let me know what you think of my new machine. Uh, let me know if you want to see anything about this in the future, what you think I should do. And uh, yeah, huge thanks to Haley once again. Thank you so, 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 so much. Wonderful. And for all the other bits and pieces in the box as well. More to be revealed about some of those MacBook pieces later on on the channel. So thank you everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.